Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday series in which I give you a weekly roundup of all the best Starship, spaceflight, and space news content that we saw over the past seven days. And it's another busy episode, as always, from Falcon 9, Orion's Voyage to the Moon, Redacted, the destruction left in the wake of the gigantic SLS launch, NASA has released some designs for some new flying Mars helicopters, and much, much more. Let's kick things off, beginning, as always, with Starship updates. While the rapid testing windows of the Starship vehicles would seem to imply that these vehicles should still be on track for rapid reuse, one thing that currently isn't looking so great for rapid reuse is the orbital launch mount, or specifically, the concrete underneath it. That massive 14 Raptor 2 engine static fire that we saw Booster 7 conduct a couple of weeks ago appears to have left quite the impact on the launch pad. Throughout the week, we've seen crews digging up and replacing the concrete underneath the orbital launch mount. It looks like they may be changing the specific type of concrete used to one that is far more resistant to impacts and extreme temperatures, which are both things that would describe what happens underneath a super heavy launch vehicle during multiple Raptor engine ignition. Let us turn our attention now to Ship 24. Last week, I talked about how it's undergoing something at suborbital pad B, as we saw lots of scaffolding of mysterious purpose being flung up around the base of the vehicle. At the time, the structure extended to just beyond the base of the aft flaps, but take a look at them now. The structure now reaches almost to the height of the payload bay door, which, as a reminder, is welded shut and is non-functional, so almost certainly isn't the subject of this scaffolding operation. What we have seen is the removal of some of the ship's heat shield tiles. You can see that they've been removed at rather uniform intervals, which just so happens to align with the location of the weld lines between the vehicle's steel ring segments. We suspect that SpaceX are reinforcing these welds, hence the need to remove the tiles, and that this is likely in response to a can crusher test we saw a few months ago, which resulted in this rather worrying looking buckling of this particular Starship test tank vehicle. Ship 25 remains in the high bay, and it's likely that it's undergoing similar reinforcement procedures to Ship 24. If applicable, of course, there is a chance that it was constructed with reinforced joints from the get-go. I guess we can put this into the unconfirmed pile for now. I'll let you know as soon as we hear more on this story. Make sure you've hit subscribe down below to ensure that you never miss an episode of Space This Week, so that you always stay looped in with Starship and launch event news. And hey, while you're down there pressing the subscribe button and of course ringing the bell, be sure to like the video if you're enjoying today flight, it really does help support this channel and I always very much appreciate it. Our dynamic aerial duo Greg Scott and Fariel took to the skies again last week to supply us all with the latest views of the Starbase facility at Roberts Road, Florida, as well as Launch Pad 39A, where SpaceX are still constructing the second Starship orbital launch facility. Looking at the Star Factory building here, work continues very nicely on this next section of the building, and over here we can see that SpaceX have largely completed the main structures of the first five segments of the next Starship Orbital Launch and Catch Tower, the location of which remains unconfirmed, but we suspect it's going to be at Launch Complex 40. We can see that at Pad 39A, not a lot has really changed with the Starship Orbital Launch site, but we can see a Falcon 9 getting ready for takeoff, and that definitely looks like a cargo dragon on top, and I must say that booster is looking very clean, almost as if it's a brand new booster. I'll cover this vehicle and its eventual launch later on in the video, but first of all, take a look at this photo from Greg. That's not the Starship Orbital Launch Tower, that's the SLS Launch Tower, now without its big orange rocket that's currently sitting at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean somewhere. But NASA shared some photos of the launch pad at 39B in the aftermath of the successful Artemis 1 launch from the Kennedy Space Center on the 16th of November. Teams conducted a post-launch assessment of the ground systems, which began the day of the launch and concluded on Friday the 18th of November. Engineers have determined that the overall mobile launcher and launch pad systems performed as designed during the launch and all remain structurally sound. That doesn't mean there wasn't any superficial damage, however. As you can see, the sheer force of the launch was enough to blow the doors off the mobile launch tower's elevators, and scorch damage and bits of debris can be seen scattered here and there. I guess, ultimately, it's impossible to launch something with the sheer power of SLS without incurring some scorch marks. 
Uh, Q looking nervously at the Starship Orbital launch site. <laughs> While we're on the subject of Artemis 1, last week I covered the launch fairly extensively, but noted that it was a bit disappointing that we didn't get any onboard views of the flight. Well, this is no longer the case. NASA has released some amazing onboard footage of the liftoff and ascent. Check that out. And here's the uh, separation of those two gigantic solid rocket boosters. Amazing stuff. We've also had some amazing external views of the Orion spacecraft orbiting the moon, courtesy of the GoPro Hero 4s mounted to it. Going back to the previously mentioned Falcon 9 scene in this photo from Greg, yep, this is the CRS-26 mission awaiting launch. SpaceX were planning to launch the CRS-26 mission on the 22nd of November, but this was unfortunately aborted due to unfavorable weather conditions at Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. A second attempt was made on the 26th of November, and this time things went a bit better. For starters, the Falcon 9 launched. The payload was the CRS-26 Cargo Dragon spacecraft headed for the International Space Station, carrying lots of supplies and science experiments, as well as a second pair of new rollout solar arrays, which will be installed on the station over the course of two spacewalks, and these will bolster the electrical power currently being generated by the station's main solar panels. The Dragon spacecraft also carried nine CubeSats, which included four satellites for the Alana 49 mission. Alana is shorthand for Educational Launch of Nanosatellites and is an initiative created by NASA to attract and retain students in the science, technology, engineering and mathematics disciplines. Of the four CubeSats on this mission, three will be used for technology demonstration purposes and one will be used for ionospheric research. The Falcon 9 booster for this mission was again, as already mentioned, brand new. Say hello to Booster B1076. I look forward to seeing this thing live a long and prosperous life after it successfully landed on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions. And how crazy is it that this is a rare occurrence, right? To see a brand new, never previously flown rocket take to the skies. Like, this is an orbital class booster, and a big one at that, and still, SpaceX are the only ones able to do this, but are able to make this look so easy and routine, it's almost boring to talk about. Almost. <laughs> it's a real credit to the amazing work of all the people working at SpaceX, they really are leading the charge in space innovation. In somewhat bittersweet news now, we saw the launch of the SpaceX UTELSAT 10B mission on Tuesday the 22nd of November. This mission saw a Falcon 9 launch the aforementioned UTELSAT 10B satellite to geosynchronous Earth orbit. Why do I describe this launch as bittersweet? Well, as you can see in the footage here, this booster has no grid fins or landing legs because in order to get the satellite to its destination, the Falcon 9 would need to burn so much fuel that it wouldn't have enough left over for a landing to be possible. And so, after 11 flights, Falcon 9B 1049 was flown expendable. This booster has had a long old history at SpaceX. It's been in service for over four years, in fact. Beginning in September 2018 with the Telstar 18V launch, it then went on to support the Iridium Next 8 launch and eight Starlink missions. Rest in pieces, B1049, and thank you for your services. Anyway, as for the payload, the UTILSAT 10B is now in orbit and it will help provide broadband to airplanes and ships. It'll spend the next five to six months traveling to its final orbital destination using its own thrusters and is scheduled to enter service in the third quarter of 2023. On the 26th of November, we had another Indian launch, which means I need to employ some sort of visual effect here, probably involving a cat video, in order to avoid getting a copyright claim from the Indian government. Yes, I and another space YouTuber colleague tried this recently and these copyright strikes are still unfortunately a thing. But regardless, a polar satellite launch vehicle took to the skies in an XL configuration from the Satish Dhawan Space Center, carrying eight nanosatellites and the EOS-06 primary payload to low Earth orbit. The EOS-06 is an Earth observation satellite, in fact that's literally what the EOS part of its name stands for, specifically it'll provide data for oceanography research. The eight nanosatellites consist of two technology demonstration platforms, four Internet of Things satellites and a small Earth observation satellite. The Mars Ingenuity helicopter has had a really successful career so far. It's performed 34 flights in total, and I think it's safe to say that it has blown any and all expectations cleanly out of the water. Ingenuity has taken some nice photos and stuff from Mars, but really, its purpose was purely to prove the validity of aerial vehicles on the Red Planet, rather than carry out extensive scientific study. But now that flying machines have been proven, NASA released this concept image of some future flying Mars rovers. 
There are three pictured here. Here is the OG, the Ingenuity helicopter. I just covered this one. But here in the foreground is one of two sample recovery helicopters slated to fly to Mars as part of the Mars Sample Return campaign. NASA is developing the sample recovery helicopters to serve as backups to the Perseverance rover in transporting sample tubes to the sample return lander, which is being developed with the European Space Agency. In the upper center of the image is the Mars Science Helicopter concept. This is a proposed follow-up to Ingenuity, a six-rotor Mars science helicopter that can be used during future Mars missions to serve as an aerial scout and carry between two to five kilograms of science instruments to study terrain that rovers can't reach. If it ever materializes, then this will be an awesome mission to see. I really hope there's a bright future for aerial vehicles on Mars. Laon Aerospace had a quiet one this week. I've been doing a master's module recently, so I've had less time to make KSP content compared to usual, but I did post some more Planet Coaster content. I embarked on building the greatest parking lot that you ever did saw. Click that card on screen if you want to see that. It's basically a one hour long Matt Laon podcast, so I hope you enjoy. And hey, if you want to see your name listed on the left there, then you can join either my channel membership scheme or my Patreon program. Links to both can be found down below. Anyway, thank you everyone so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.